Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Bott. I'm the Head of Innovation at the Society for Chemical Industry, and it's my uh, uh, pleasure to uh, host this afternoon's uh, webinar. There's a combined Q&A session at the end, but the Q&A box, which is on the right-hand side of your screen under questions, is open from the beginning, and please uh, put your questions in there. Um, at the end of the session, Tom, who uh, is on the line with me, will be uh, picking them off in, in order, trying to combine and, and join them together if necessary, and asking them of the three panelists, who will then answer um, in, you know, their, their aspects of the whole thing. Uh, so it, it, it is a, uh, really important that you put some in because otherwise you get Tom and my questions that we've pre-prepared and trust me, yours will be better. Um, so we're gonna uh, have a short introduction, as I said, uh, and then our first speaker is Jan Godsell, who's gonna be talking about supply chain digital readiness. Um, and uh, Jan uh, is a WMG, great person. I'll introduce her a bit in the morning. Then we're going through to uh, using digital technology to link the digital and physical worlds. And that's particularly important up and down supply chains. Jan's going to be talking about the, the commercial, the, the resilience and all those sorts of things. And Jeremy's going to introduce some ideas about circularity and sustainability. Uh, and then uh, Mike Horton uh, from Siemens is going to be talking about how you can do the whole thing uh, in Digital Twins from really from the beginning. Uh, and if you've been with us on this series, you know, we started off with designing molecules and mixtures, went through processes, and this is then the supply chain thing. And as it's, uh, said, at the end of it, there'll be a facilitated Q&A, and we'll try and finish by uh, 3.30. Uh, uh, and if there are still questions over at the end, we'll, we'll go back to them uh, later and, and reply uh, individually to you and the people. Okay, so, this is the third of the digital design webinars. We've been running them over a few months. As I say, we started off with um, the, the design of molecules and mixtures. So what products do you want to be and, and all the digital tools that are uh, available for that. Then we went on to the processes, both how to optimize an existing process and build in a new uh, process. But this one's about life cycles. Life cycles are more complicated um, than uh, just what you do inside your own factory because you have to rely on other people's data, you have to give them your data. So there's an element of, of, of interoperability, there's an element of, of trust and all sorts of things. So it's really quite important that it, we get this one right. Um, I'm sure, sure Mike at the end will, will, will talk about the importance of digitalization across all industries. It is changing just about every bit of, of, of business and particularly manufacturing and making things because it enables you to be that much more uh, productive, that's much more consistent in your quality, and to be more flexible in the way you use your kit. This all came out of the work by the Chemistry Council, uh, which published a strategy a couple of years ago, which identified digitalization as an important thing for the chemical and chemistry using industries to embrace. And that was taken up by the Innovation Committee, which is basically um, R&D directors from a number of the chemical and chemistry using industries in the UK. And the SCI provides the secretariat for that. So these, these are the three willing victims this afternoon, uh, all excellent experts and great communicators in their own area. Uh, so they're going to be talking about the aspects I talked about earlier. Um, and so, you know, once again, questions all the way through, put them in the question box and we'll talk to them. So uh, Jeremy, once again, is a fascinating human being. Uh, uh, he's been around for a long time. I've run off into him a number of times in my career. Uh, He's a, the professor of physical chemistry and the head of the computational systems group at the uh, University of Southampton. He's been involved in all sorts of things, but he, he, he started off with chemistry, but he's become much more than that. He, he, he likes working with people who aren't chemists, which is really rather good. Uh, and uh, yeah, we had some fascinating conversations in the lead up to this, this workshop about um, what's already going on in this field. So Jeremy, can I turn over to you, please? Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about this. Uh, right, I start with a background in physical chemistry and move through the, the UK science program and into the digital economy program. And I'm very interested in what digital can do to the whole of chemistry, both research and business um, in the UK and globally. So I want to talk to you about you know, sort of what I call digital chemical intelligence and looking at some of the digitalization and knowledge flows that can go on. And as David said earlier, 
um, try and highlight some of the issues that concern me a lot around trying to understand how we can improve the sustainability and circularity of the system um, and uh, all act together rather than just you know producers and consumers through all of this i'd say you know science is what i do and what we investigate and that's that is the side i come from um, i uh, work with businesses but i haven't yet uh, i didn't see the light early enough to actually to go into business and earn some money um, but what we're doing the science, what we're investigating generally in science as a scientific approach and so on. Um, but the methodologies that we now bring to that uh, uh, called these different technoscape, technoscapes um, and the digital technoscape, how we investigate, the increasing use of digital technologies for doing the work as well as getting the sort of numbers in at the end of the day. And it's that dual approach as to what we want to investigate and the way we might investigate it. Uh, that underpins a lot of the work that uh, I've been doing in the last few years. So let's have a look um, at my sort of general idea about what uh, our supply chain might be. Uh, we ran some meetings a number of years ago about physical, linking up physical and digital. And so underneath some of these slides, you'll see uh, one of these uh, uh, figure captured of a meeting. We had somebody capturing our meeting and the lots of things. You might find the cartoon of me under there somewhere. But here I've taken our hurricane system and just you know put some parts of the labels of what you could crudely have as a supply chain. We have the real materials, it's manufactured, it's consumed, and increasingly we need to worry about how to recycle it. And I've put this up really to illustrate the, the flow. So this is generally the flow of the physical goods. You dig up something, you do something to it. Um, David talked about previous here where, where we make molecules and make mixtures and from mixtures you make materials and materials you make devices and they appear places. Um, they deliver to the consumer, they work for some time, you may be able to fix them uh, and then those materials move on rap more or less rapidly and either th have been thrown away or we need to undo them and that's generally the flow of the, the physical material. But that's not the only thing that's going on and this is what I've kind of been trying to uh, feel around over the last few years is that particularly once we have a lot more of involvement of surface the information that's involved in the supply chains um, and these by the way can be a research site, supply chain we in research we are in the middle of a supply chain just in the same way as if you're manufacturing um, other physical goods and once we've got these digital supply chains we can actually think more carefully and connect up the way that the information flows as well as the way the goods flow. So I've put here, still here's my picture of the, the way that the, the physical flow, that's the hurricane in the Northern Hemisphere, that in the Southern Hemisphere, the flow of the information, of the flow of the cyclones is the other way around. And what I want to emphasize here is that when you do have physical goods, the, te the, good, the flow tends to be in one direction. Once you start imagining about the information, that is associated with this and often that was something you could stamp at best on a piece of packaging or maybe somebody could look it up or maybe it was something you wanted to keep secret um, that information is now available uh, digitally and can flow around with the goods but importantly it doesn't have to flow around just in that direction so information to the consumer can flow with the goods and information about the use and the consuming of those goods flows backwards along that same supply chain and the efficiency with which it flows in these directions may have absolutely nothing to do with the efficiency that you move the actual goods themselves. Um, but what you do about the goods that you're shipping around the place and what consumers do or what, what they do when they shouldn't do and where it goes afterwards and what you can do when you recycle it depends hugely on what has happened to it. And that's the information that can now flow forwards and backwards down and around these supply chains. Um, in particular, for example, we're hugely worried these days about provenance. What are the goods, what they say they are, where have they come from? Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the recent statement that has got to certify goods that come from the rainforest area as definitely certified as um, from areas that are sustainable forests. This is going to cause lots of people lots of problems. And I'm sure a lot of very interesting certificates uh, proving this are going to turn up. How do we ensure the validity of the chain of information. How do we ensure that it is intact, that information flows from all the way around it? Um, we often can work out who we just got something from, what information came with that, but where did they get it from? And that provenance chain is really important and is all about here, the, the, the digital flow in that direction. 
But as I said before, the information flowing back in the other direction is equally valuable. And that's part of maybe the trade. I supply you with information, you supply me back with information about what happened to the things I gave you. Now, the technologies around this sort of provenance and labeling it, maybe in the old days called it metadata, well, I might call it just information. Um, it's the data, but importantly, in lots of things that we deal with, it's knowing what that information actually means. So the semantics of that information um, is really important. Sometimes referred to as the metadata. So uh, it's not just any good sending numbers backwards and forwards. Uh, we, I still occasionally teach in the teaching labs and you know, the students write down 10. And you say, 10 what? what? I say, well, it's 10 degrees. Well, okay, and so it's a temperature of what? That in, just the numbers themselves, um, not enough. You actually have to have a context for this information. And that's where, for example, the technologies that have come grown up and uh, are really becoming useful now, the semantic web, are really very useful in providing this annotation. Because this annotation is not just for human beings to consume. If it's small scale, then something that labels it, people are pretty good at interpreting what some of these phrases mean. But we can't do that on any scale. If you want to do it on scale, we need to use the computers. If we've got the computers involved, they've got to be able to uh, in some sense, understand what these numbers are, what this data means, what this information is about. For that, you need the sort of annotation that is uh, computer and human friendly. It's got to be available to both. It's one of the problems has been when it's only con computer consumable, you have no human in the loop there who can interpret it, and then you lose trust in that data as well. So it's human and computer consumable. And the semantic technologies are really good for this. But to do that, uh, you need um, these uh, taxonomies and schemas and ultimately some ontologies to be able to link together these explanations. And uh, this is not easy. And this sign, high winds may exist, I think summarizes many of the problems around some of the ontologies that the, the knowledge technologies that have been produced to try and label these things. And uh, that's why we need a lot of much more community involvement, much more dynamic behavior here so that when you're confronted with something and you can't explain it within the current terminology, the current stratification, the current system, uh, you can do something about it and, and it put your views in so that it becomes a community exercise that imbues it with much more interest and trust and usefulness in the community. And that's an area that needs to be developed. But to give you a link, uh, an idea of how one might use these things to improve the, the linking of the physical and the the, the digital world, I refer you back to the barcode. Um, and if you, some of you may have listened to the 50 things that made the modern economy, the episode on the barcode is fascinating about the invention of the barcode, which was first used in Chicago, but how that was all tied up with containerization and everything that in, improved the enormously the efficiency of, of movement of goods and doc, information about those goods around the global economy. Uh, the QR codes, the 2D versions of these things that are used all over the place now, it was airline codes and much more, um, I highlight their use in a project that I've been involved in to connect up chemistry um, and these things. So linking here, we've got a caffeine molecule, some of you probably consuming it, um, and we, uh, the IUPAC worked with a number of people to develop a way of coding that to produce an identifier that would be unique so that there was it was possible to uniquely label compounds so it's much easier to sort them and understand stuff, being extremely useful when chemical companies have merged. Um, produces this long string, and we can encode that as a QR code. So the QR code over here uh, actually has this inchy in it. And if you were to read that with a QR code reader, you would get just inchy. And from the inchy code, you could go back to the, um, the molecule. Unfortunately, as with many of these things, um, then that can be a very long string and variable length, not very good to put into a fixed length key somewhere. So Inchi group came up with an Inchi key, which is an encoding of this, and it never has any more letters than this. Um, that's obviously much easier to encode in the QR code, but to go back to the actual Inchi in the molecule, you need to resolve this. This is a kind of hash, so it's not, um, e you can't invert that easily. You need a resolver. And that one of the things, one of the reasons why I highlight this is that we've connected here a physical and digital link, but it presents us with an interesting business challenge, which is that I can go from the molecule to the code easily enough with a bit of code that I give out to you, no trouble. 
to go backwards, I need everybody to contribute to that. So when they put a new molecule in, got a new inchy key, we've got to have a system here um, somewhere lodged around to resolve this. And there are some uh, international efforts to do that, but the business case associated with keeping this chain working highlighted another aspect to me, which is that digitizing part of a chain is interesting, useful, has some gain, but often presents you with an enormous number of other challenges. Digitizing the whole chain so that this kind of thing is done from the start to the finish and round again, then is when you see the huge advantages. And I'm sure the other speakers will mention some of these aspects. So doing bits piecemeal is useful, but often increases your costs initially. When they're all together, then it improves things more. And here is one of the aspects that if you actually do have um, the these things digitized and you have QR codes using this with our augmented reality type system. So here's a whole library of compounds. Um, we don't know which ones uh, you need to be careful about, but with a phone app here in principle, we can look over it and um, get some, not only find out what, what's on there, magnify it, get some information about it, but also maybe get some warnings about being careful if we're going to start shipping this stuff around. But QR codes don't always enhance safety like this. This was a good one um, over in the London Tube. Um, not really very useful to put a QR code on the opposite side and tempt people to cross the rails. So we have to be careful about a number of these things. So this uh, opening up of these chains and the digitalization uh, does open up stuff. It does expose more things potentially. There are ways of doing it not so exposed, but it generally, this goes along with the kind of open science, open innovation movement. And that's another reason why I've been involved with it. And the caveats around putting things open um, are well taken. And there are issues around personal information or uh, minority groups and so on. And I think we have to face up with those. At the moment, so, uh, the gain made by making a lot more of the information around the supply chain open um, is certainly, uh, it's been shown to be a significant advantage, um, but there are issues. Uh, so current behavior tends not to provide this information around the goods, or at least not make it easy to move in both directions. Information is supply, take the uh, safety information sheets about some chemicals. The feedback is not always that easy back to the customer, from the customer to the supplier. And that's one of the really important things that can be enabled in the digital world. But of course, consuming that information that I highlighted with the semantic annotation is tricky. And that's where some of the standards come in. And we have, you know, no standards are so good. We have lots of them. Electricity is really these plugs. Look at how many different ones. On the other hand, many of you traveling when we used to travel might have realized there were some very innovative sockets now that allow multiple plugs in them. So there are interesting solutions to this that are enabled by new ideas and new technology. But I'm very keen that I think one of the public interventions that's needed here is to set some of these standards. Because if we set the standards, then people will use them. If we don't set the standards, then many of the big multinationals will set a standard and will become vertically integrated, not enabling the horizontal playground that encourages more innovation and more participation and more employment. There's a lot of use. If you've got all the data, well, then it's great. You can make inferences from it. Um, people can, but we also now have a big push on artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, but if we're going to use that, we need the quality data. To get the quality data, we need this information to flow in the digital system. And we coined the kind AI needs IA, artificial intelligence needs information architecture. If you don't have the right architecture, if you don't have the right mechanisms to feed the data around, you can't draw conclusions from it. And there's no point in doing the AI bit if you can't fix the architecture first. But the architecture is a very good driving case um, driving case for the architecture is the use in artificial intelligence. But the supply chains, it's very obvious in chemistry and others, we've done some work with food, are very complex things. And a lot of the agreements one strikes around exchanging data involve not some sort of trust and some sort of data trust, and they're very often local. So one of the areas that we're looking at in terms of underlying uh, mathematics, and this applies to came from uh, thinking about chemical pathways, is how do things, if you do deals locally, how does that affect the global flow? What are the necessary conditions on local things to ensure the global flow will work? And there's a lot of work going on um, coming from ecology and sustainable systems and fragility and so on. A lot of interesting work in mathematics there, chemical networks that I think can be applied more generally. 
And as we expose more of this data, and make it more understandable and interpretable and computable, we can go down this line of trying to understand how to improve the resiliency of, of the flow of data and the flow of goods. I highlight, I just I thought this is an interesting example of the complexities here. And many of you will be aware of the whole issue around tetraethyl lead in fuel, um, which was initially put in things like the Spitfires to stop them coking up. But then that was great uh, for stopping the knocking, and you've got these anti knock agents that then needed, that produced the lead, but then the lead was there, so you needed to, to make lead bromide to take it away, so you want to put ethylene bromide in. And during the Second World War, unbelievably, all the bromine came from Israel Palestine area, and it came through the Mediterranean, through um, areas that were not exactly safe, all the way to Britain. Shipping bromine is not the easiest thing to do. I'm not sure what the material data sheet would have said in those days. But that's the sort of uh, complex supply chain under difficult circumstances that I think illustrates some of the issues that we'd want to be able to deal with and understand much better um, in terms of the digital information flow. All the time, I still often have reduced to use the terms producers and consumers, um, uh, but uh, we are all part of a cycle here, especially when we look at the sustainability and the recycling. So really, it's about materials and data, and we want these things to work together. And yet some may recognize this as the double spiral staircase in Reading's chemistry department. The nice thing about this is the students going up and the students going down don't meet each other in DNA analogy. That's if they do the right way. Um, the problem about that it illustrates is you can have people and things in the same space uh, that don't communicate with, with, with each other. And at the moment, the, the standards involved in communicating data and explanations are such that this is frequently the case and we fail to communicate when we need to. And that's something we have to address. So this was hopefully an opportunity to, to uh, alert you to some of these issues. And I often finish the talk with this slide. And I have to say that it, actually, every, uh, definitely uh, every electronic communication superhighway now makes a difference, and we are learning how to schmooze over the internet. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Excellent talk. So I believe we've we've we found Jan Godsall from WMG. Uh, like like all of the people on this thing, Jan's had a great career with lots of experiences. She, although she works at uh, WMG at the moment, um, she's actually had a career going through various universities and businesses it's important thing she brings with her the experience of how to do this not just from a theoretical point of view but from a practical point of view um, she runs a very strong uh, supply chain group at warwick and i recommend all of the uh, seminars and webinars she does there so without further ado can i hand over to you please jan Thank you, David, for the very nice introduction. I'm Jan Godsell. I'm a professor of operations and supply chain strategy. But I did start um, my life, um, my industrial life, um, way back in 1989, actually, as a um, sponsored student by ICI. Um, and then I went on after I graduated to work in the pharmaceutical industry. So um, my roots very, very much go back to um, chemicals and chemistry, though I perhaps explored it in a slightly different way. So there's three things that I'd like to um, share with you. Firstly, is this idea of creative destruction. Um, then a little bit about what a supply chain is. And uh, this might build upon um, what Jeremy was just talking about in terms of um, the flow of materials and um, information, but perhaps we'll talk about some other flows too. And then I'm going to share with you, and again, I think there's some parallels with Jeremy's presentation, but we'll also some segues into Mike's thinking about ways in which you could digitize your supply chain. And I'd encourage you, please, please do add some questions into the chat if you get a chance, because it will just liven up the debate. So um, one of the things that slightly frustrated me, um, not that I have anything against German industrial strategy, I'd always perhaps have liked that we were slightly at the fore with um, UK industrial strategy, was this use of the term industry for Point zero, which really is a word that doesn't mean very much. Um, and there was a futurist um, called Sean Cully um, who perhaps described what's going on in terms of our industrial revolutions in a way that made slightly more sense to me, because what he defined it by, um, the graph at the top shows um, a rolling 10-year yield for the S&P 500. And what you can see is essentially periods of boom and periods of um, recession. 
And what you can see that these tend to be driven by different power sources, they're supported by different types of transport and different types of communication, and therefore different types of industries thrive. And coming out of the global economic crisis in 2008, there is no doubt that we're entering a new stage of our industrial evolution. But I would argue that it's not just one that's enabled by technology, although digital is very, very important. But perhaps if we think a little bit um, about what Jeremy was saying, perhaps there's more fundamental shift in um, what's driving what we'll see as our um, current transition points. And really transition points are that point at which in our um, global economic cycles, um, we see industries um, beginning to come to saturation and we see growth stalling, um, debt bubbles, industries crashes and jobs are lost. But what we begin to see is moving through a rebirth into a period of innovation where investment moves to industry, inventions become innovations and new business models begin to appear. And many of you will have heard the term build back better. It didn't actually start with the UK's 10 point plan for green rejuvenation. I think I first heard it used by the United Nations. Um, I am particularly interested, and it's interesting that Jeremy talked about production and consumption. United Nations Sustainability Goal 12 talks about the need for us to, um, to support more responsible consumption and production. And this is because, and this is what I'd argue the transition point's really about, and what our next generation of our industrial revolution is about, is that um, consumption-driven economic growth, the benefits of that are beginning to be outweighed by the social and the environmental cost. And therefore, as we move forward into this sixth wave, as Sean would see it, we need to think of ways of doing that where we de can decouple economic growth from the social and environmental impact. And this will lead us to a whole different set of business models. And it's against that backdrop, I would really challenge you to go back to think about what a supply chain means to your organisation. Back in 1989, ICI was a very vertically integrated organisation and did just about everything itself. It had um, extreme global reach, but it was pretty clear who managed that supply chain. But slightly earlier, and 1982 was the year that I am... Um, David always likes references to uh, pop music, but this was the year that uh, Dex's Midnight Runners um, were in the charts. Um, basically, um, the term supply chain, as with many things, was first formally defined by um, consultants. Those existed for thousands and thousands of years. And really what they argued was that it brings together under one strategy the areas of planning, production, manufacturing, distribution and sales. So pretty much everything. And this was extended by Michael Porter, um, the strategist from Harvard, who extended this to the concept of a value chain. And here he extended that idea of a supply chain to be beyond the bounds of a firm. And I don't know whether you know, but there's actually a global industry standard. So Jeremy talked about standards, um, which was developed by the Supply Chain Council. It's now owned by Apex. So what used to be a nice free resource now costs you money to get hold of. But essentially, many fast moving consumer goods firms, many CG, CPG firms, a lot. So I, I see this quite a lot within pharmaceutical and agrochemical firms. They use um, this model of understanding their supply chain as comprising of these core processes planning, which is the overarching one that's the glue that joins everything together. And then these cycles of sourcing or procurement, making and manufacture, delivering and logistics. But increasingly, also um, these ideas about return and what we do with things when we finish with them. And what we must remember, and this is actually um, a supply chain um, for British American tobacco, but this is pretty much the same chain that you would see for most farmer organizations, agrochemicals, where there's a, a global supply chain normally for an active ingredient. You know, um, then there's a regional supply chain normally around formulation, fill and pack. And then there's a local supply chain that sees the distribution of that product to the end market or the end consumer. And that end to end supply chain um, needs to be potentially coordinated end to end. And that's a huge, huge job. I can remember uh, uh, it was at BAT, they used to have a group ops director and he used to say my job was dog. But um, a couple of years later, his job name was rebranded to director of group operations and he became a dog. But to be honest, whether you're a god or a dog, managing an entire supply chain end to end is very, very difficult. And what we tend to see is that supply chains get broken up into these arcs of integration and then we seek to uh, synchronize between them. And fundamentally, we're only trying to do something very, very simple. We're trying to balance demand and supply. 
Um, and if demand signals were nice and stable, which um, for many, many products they actually are, then that job would be fairly simple and we could um, create flow with minimal buffers and buffers being inventory or spare manufacturing capacity. But for some other products, demand's a bit more variable. And when things are variable, if we want to meet customer service, we need to put buffers in place to buffer against that uncertainty. And that gives us inventory or spare manufacturing capacity. And um, a lot of the work that I do is really about understanding those demand signals so that we can decompose those demand signals so we can make things flow at the pull of the customer. Um, but we do so whilst minimizing those buffers so that we can deliver customer value at lowest supply chain cost. Because ultimately what your organizations are about is maximizing your profits, minimizing your losses and managing risk. And this guy here, if you were here, I'd ask you if any of you know who he is, is actually Martin Christopher, who is pretty much a founding father of modern day supply chain, particularly in UK and Europe. But back in 1992, he argued that it's supply chains that compete and not companies, and he couldn't have been more right. And this led us on to think about, therefore, what is a digital supply chain? And I perhaps think about it in a different way because those basic principles of supply chain still hold. Perhaps what digitization provides us with is an opportunity to actually do it better. Because um, if you think about your own organizations, I'm sure that they're troubled by lots of sub optimization where perhaps procurement are making decisions that are good for procurement, but not necessarily good for manufacturing or manufacturing makes a decision to stockpile, but it, it may actually make it difficult to then store products. And if we actually think about something like COVID-19 and some of the latest vaccines, um, some of those vaccines have got, very, have got much, much easier logistics routes than some of the others. And these are the sorts of things that if you're thinking about things end to end and their end to end effectiveness, you might need to trade off. So in conjunction with an organization called Blue Yonder, we did a survey, we, we actually developed a supply chain digital readiness tool. And in fact, um, I can provide um, a link to you afterwards. You're welcome to go online and actually assess your own supply chain digital readiness and get your own report for free at the end. But essentially, against um, a number of different supply chain core processes within your business, we helped you to assess um, what level you were at. And perhaps the easiest way to think about this is at the strategy level. So are you still at the stage where really you've only got end-to-end um, -end visibility of functions, so you're focused on departmental reporting? Or are you at the stage where you're focused on efficiency and functional optimization? Or have you managed to move your business so that you're actually looking at things dynamically end-to-end -end and you can optimize your end-to-end -end supply chain? Or are you at level four, four where you're proactive and can manage your end-to-end -end business um, in, with total visibility of the entire ecosystem. So I do wish you were a live audience and you can type your what numbers into the chat function if you wanted to, but um, I'd ask you what level you thought that organizations were at. And the reality is when we surveyed more than 180 manufacturers, um, we found that only 13% of companies were actually at level three, which means that, you know, that means that um, the vast majority of companies were still only at a stage where they were using digital technologies to help them optimize individual functions. But slightly more scarily, by 2023, this was still only expected to increase to about a third of organizations being able to optimize their end-to-end -end supply chain. Even in 2023, 70% of them thought they'd still only be optimizing their individual um, functions. And these were the types of operational processes that we looked at. Um, and as you can see, for any of you that work on the more operational side of your businesses, you will see that these are pretty much all of the core processes that would help you to deliver your products um, through manufacturing to your end consumers. And interestingly, when we looked at technologies, the predominant technologies that organizations are currently using are really related to leveraging their data infrastructure. So it's how you build a data backbone. Um, with some of the technologies that are perhaps around increasing data capture and then um, how you can use that captured data to make better decisions being the next generations. So that was a fairly um, sobering picture. So we thought about how can we actually help organizations to digitize their supply chains? And we identified four different strategies of which we'd argue that you can actually use potentially all four of these simultaneously, though some would be more transformative to your business than others. So very briefly, the first of those is actually what people are currently doing, which is really using digital technologies to actually make their core processes, this be this planning, manufacturing, logistics, procurement better. 
And the critical steps here are really to continue to build that data infrastructure. Some of the biggest issues that organizations currently have around poor data quality. And quite often, the large multinationals we work with, one of the biggest projects they do first is actually a data cleansing or creating, um, even within their own organization, a clean data set. The second thing then is to really improve your data capture, but only where that data will really add value because that will then enable you. And these days, there's great news. There's lots of relatively cheap and simple add-on type of analytics solutions you can then use to use that enhanced data system to make better decisions. And what that will help you do is to sustain your legacy business, because although many of your businesses may need to transform, you may have products that actually wouldn't ever be close to what we could consider as net zero by 2050. Um, you need to continue that revenue stream, that business today, whilst you transition to your new business model of tomorrow. And in doing so, this will help you create a bedrock of operational excellence, which will free up the cash within your organization to enable you to do that. The second, and this is perhaps the most challenging of all of these strategies, and the one that really will take you from maturity level two to maturity level three, is actually, um, and many of you come from, um, the, in the chemical industry, you will have had very, very strong new product development processes. I, I know this from my own days, going back to the late 80s, you know, new product development has always been seen as absolutely critical in the chemicals industry. And perhaps increasingly too, maybe the way in which you relate to your customers, the CRM or marketing processes, but believe it or not, there has always been an equivalent process, end-to-end -end business process for the supply chain, yet it's barely, 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 very rarely adopted in organizations. In fact, when we did a, a study in um, 2016 and um, looked at the degree to which um, manufacturing organizations in Europe adopted a um, process orientation to their organization structure, it was only 17%. A good example is Beiersdorf, that's a company you should be able to relate to, who had a classic matrix of functions and regions, but on top of that, they had four core business processes, new product development, um, marketing, supply chain, and also brand management. Because it's only if you can take this end-to-end -end business process orientation to your business that you will achieve end-to-end -end supply chain integration. And the great news is, if you're willing to, there are lots of different digital, technology, te digital technological solutions that can help you do that. And actually, um, David knows that we're, uh, um, supply chains are essentially about the management of um, three flows. Um, the two that um, Jeremy mentioned, which would be um, materials and information, but also cash. And I would argue, increasingly going forward, carbon. And unfortunately, that the flow of cash is a reason why many people won't share their information because they're scared that that inf the information they share could be used against them. If we start equating things in terms of carbon rather than cost, perhaps we can find a new neutral way to actually create end-to-end -end integration. The other thing I would encourage you all to do is to play. Um, many of you are chemists, you love to play in your labs. Well, see your factories and your supply chains as a living lab, somewhere where you can try out little digital technologies in, in different ways and see what works, see what, um, and fail fast, but where you see promising practices, then scale them up quickly. And last but not least, um, for many of your businesses to thrive in this very changing landscape, where we are seeing a shift um, much more to um, a different economy, one that's based much more on the principles of circularity and sharing as we seek to develop business models that enable us to um, support consumers but in a more responsible way, which probably means we're going to have to find out ways of making money by selling less. And this means that we're going to see much more of a shift towards products and services linking together where we look at things like leasing models or pay for use models. Um, and this is enabled because we now have these technologies that enable connectivity. But what it's also likely to see is a change in the way that we set up our uh, production networks. And um, we saw that global, regional, local shift before. Actually, I think we'll see a greater shift to regional and local um, techniques as we seek to um, look at how we can reuse, remake and redistribute things. And I think if you think about many aspects of the chemical industry, one of the things you do is move things around, whether that be pharmaceuticals in blister strips or plastic bottles, whether that's agrochemicals in drums or bigger plastic bottles. And I think one of the things you're gonna to have to face is those challenges or even inhalers where the device is made of plastic. 
um, we're going to have to think much more carefully about how we actually design those supply chains in a way that meets consumer needs, but in a way that potentially reduces some of those wastes that are inherent in the process. And so I'd encourage you all to be as creative as possible, to be as innovative as possible, but to think about that beyond the realms of the traditional R&D within the lab and to think about these four di di digital strategies and the way that you can harness them across these different aspects of your supply chain to really harness the potential of this ne next wave of creative destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Excellent talk. So finally, Mike Horton. Um, Mike, uh, works for Siemens. Siemens has been known for a long time as driving uh, the digital um, push in manufacturing. They even loaned their CEO to the British government for a while. Um, but the interesting thing that came up in, in the conversation with Mike is that PSE, which is the company, is, is the front end of the supply chain. So Siemens now provides software solutions uh, pretty much up and down the whole supply chain, the intellectual supply chain, the, the one that, that Jeremy was talking about. So um, it's with great pleasure that I asked Mike to, to, to talk about how digitalization could be applied in the chemical manufacturer and and you think you'll see how it all fits together yep so i'm mike horton i'm a, um, a director at psc um but a bit, bit of a background about myself is uh um, after i graduated i was invited back to do um, um a phd in bioreactor control using um machine learning and it just kind of makes me smile now. I actually didn't do the PhD. I went into industry and decided to, uh, that was my, my roots, as it were. Uh, but it's always stayed with me, those thinkings. And I've done lots of machine learning. I've done lots of mechanistic modeling and a whole host of things throughout my life in lots of different industries as well. So I've worked at Genentech, at Pfizer, GSK, um, Chevron, single boy moorings. I've, all over the world so i've had quite a lot of experience and a few years ago i was when uh, the ceo that was loaned out to the british government that was a uh, jaeger Mai, who was my boss i was managing director of uh, uh, siemens uh, process industries and drives for uk ireland nigeria and ghana that's interesting as well um uh, and then i, I was I, I was at an odds what to do next and uh, uh, siemens invited me to to lead their digital strategy uh, globally in Germany. So I moved over to Germany for uh, a little while. And whilst I was in Germany, um, a company that I put forward as a company she should partner with, that was PSE, Siemens uh, made the move to acquire them. And the managing board asked me to come back to the UK and help with the integration of the acquired company. So that's a bit about my background and where I'm from. Um, so what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk a little bit about PSE. It won't be too much. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about digital twins. And I'm going to give you a Siemens-centric view of what a digital twin is, and then try and put a bit of a process swing on it. I'll talk a bit about the benefits um, uh, this twinning technology can deliver to customer bases. And then finally, I'll, I'll walk through an example of the extent of what a process digital twin could look like. Uh, and this one, uh, it actually does, it doesn't just twin the chemical synthesis, it goes right the way through into the entire supply chain, but in, inside one organization. So it's not multiple organizations. A little bit about uh, PSE. Uh, those that, yeah, I'm sure many of you know PSE uh, and the organization based out of uh, Hammersmith. It was uh, actually formed back in the late, uh, 1980s um, out of Imperial College London and then about a decade later after it being formed it was uh, spun out into what's called uh, PSA today and their platform of choice is uh, something called GPROMS uh, that's uh, the modeling platform um, and back in September um, Siemens uh, this is September 13 14 months ago now Siemens uh, acquired them and at that point, uh, uh, in terms of geography, you know, about 100 and, it was actually about 160 people. It's now about 220. Siemens has invested a lot, even during COVID. Um, and a large percentage of those people uh, are PhDs in chemical engineering. Uh, and what's, PH, uh, what's PSE's uh, mission? It's to bring the next, next generation 
uh, model, uh, process modeling and optimization technology to the process industry sector. Right, that's essentially what it is, and that was the reason why it was an attractive acquisition for Siemens. Um, there's me in the front, and anyone that knows PSC, you'll probably know Costas and Mark there. Uh, there's the PSC officers, but uh, also Hammersmith this. Um, and with the acquisition, we were thinking about bringing these, uh, the automation world, the process automation world, uh, together with the modeling way of uh, process and process chemistry. So we combine uh, model-based technology from PSC, uh, we're planning automation and simulation technologies from Siemens, and the idea is we're going to add much more value uh, to the, the whole life cycle of the process industry sector by stringing this together. Um, in when I talk about the life cycle, I'm just throwing this slide up just to uh, contextualize when we talk about PSC. We talk right from uh, R&D through engineering uh, through to operations. Um, and if it's of interest, um, you probably know a lot of desktop software anyway by the likes of Aspen and uh, maybe some of our other competitors. Uh, but what's, what we're trying, what we are doing and delivering is taking those models that are used to optimize in terms of conceptual design, front end feed study, and the optimization processes during the engineering design and actually taking them and using them in what we call digital applications for real-time intervention. So adding benefits like real-time optimization, decision support, run-length prediction, catalyst optimization, soft sensing, the whole host of things as just a few mentioned. So that's a bit about PSC and the reason for the acquisition. And now I'm going to give you a bit of a backdrop to how Siemens views the digital twin. Uh, to put things in context, Siemens has spent around uh, 10 billion euros over the last 15 years in uh, acquisition of software companies, and it spends around about 10% of its revenue on R&D to make its own platforms as well. So Siemens is recognized for being um, steadfast in the market around its uh, issues, say process control, its hardware, its motors, its drives, its motion control. But more and more, we're seeing it move into the digital space uh, and the software space where the modeling tools and some of it's grown internally, but much more now is uh, it's being done by, a, by acquisition. So if I start this, this is the digital enterprise that we see um, uh, Siemens, and we've got this idea of a digital product twin. I hope you can see the video flashing through, but that's uh, these are uh, graphics associated with, I'm going to say, more the discrete industries as it happens, you know, manufacturing of cars and aerospace and the likes. And that's called what we call the digital product twin, or very often called the virtual product. Then we link this to a digital uh, twin for production. So you can see here now this is around the robots or the processes that are required to um, um, build that product. It's the production details. And very often this extends beyond the automation and has human factors built in as well. And we take that digital twin data and we actually, that's called our virtual production environment. And then we move it to uh, what's called our, this is the real automation now. Uh, and the real process automation. And I'm sorry for the graphics, we intended to be more of the discrete industries, but this is where Siemens is known a lot, uh, and it probably leads the market. Well, it doesn't probably, it is, it's number one in the market in this arena. So that's the, the actual uh, automation side, the production side, that links to that virtual production. And then finally, uh, we come onto the real product itself. Um, and this is around, okay, so we, we, we get the production, we get the product, now we look at the performance of that product in field. And um, to skip this next one, it goes on a little longer. Um, so that's the real product, and we use this information and feedback in terms of performance data, and we use that data to calibrate the models for both production and the product itself. And this continuous loop here is, uh, the most cyclic way I can look at this and how we how how 
our tool sets comes together. So it's not a one shot, um, should we say, modeling exercise. That model that you build in terms of the, or the twin that you build in, in terms of the production twin um, or, or the product twin, it keeps its value for much longer than just the initial exercise of design and build. Okay, uh, so uh, how does that relate to the, the process sector? Well, for us, it's all about things like R&D, reducing upscale experimental data, rapid exploration of design space for what if scenarios. We do a lot with uh, value engineering for upscaling uh, scenario. We use actually uh, an, a product called HEADS that will rapidly explore that space for us as well. Um, and, and we also take those models into the off, uh, online operations for soft sensing, forecasting, uh, real-time optimization, and the likes. Machines. I'm now going to talk a little bit about that's the twinning. Now the benefits for the process sector. I've got two slides here. One slide focuses on the chemical and energy industries, and the top sections here. These use cases. These are all published. So if you were to go to the PSE website, you get more details on these use cases. Um, and then you'll see the operation side uh, beneath that. You'll actually see a benefit case uh, in terms of dollar value, uh, much more on the operation side, because when you're on the design side from a static point of view, it's hard to depict how much the value you're saving. It's um, because it's a one-time value. So if your plan's run up for 30 years, is if you've created a 5% a efficiency gain in terms of your design, do you actually multiply that by the 30 years it's in production for? So the, the mainly the uh, the benefits are identified here on the bottom. I'm not going to read them all verbatim. I don't have time. I'll just touch on a few. So if you see this one, one here, um, this one for Shell, uh, and it's got a uh, hundred million on here. This was a, an entire network oil field, and I'm going to show you an example of what that might uh, look like in a later demonstration. Utilities, this is about linking all the decision space for production of a chemical facility. So you're looking at things like gas, electricity, compressed air, etc. Um, energy uh, consumptions as well. And the, the final one there on the bottom is just um, online your prediction. This is looking at soft sensing around coke monitoring. monitoring. Um, so that's for typically for uh, chemicals uh, and the oil and gas market. Uh, and this one here is just a typical backdrop of what we do with uh, the pharmaceutical, especially the chemical and their food and bev environments. And again, I'm not going to read it all verbatim, um, but this is often called formulated products in our world, and um, perhaps uh, we use it as well. And what's interesting here, if I pick on this one here, Pia, uh, you know, this is, you know, our models in the pharmaceutical environment uh, go right the way through from you know, production for the API, the formulation, actually then into product performance in vitro or viral. Uh, so uh, a lovely example I love to quote to is one of our uh, customers that they filed uh, for a patent and they, they found that the, the absorption of the, the drug uh, was, was fine in the, in the trials. Uh, but obviously when you're trialing, you're normally trialing with healthy patients, not with students. Um, well, they found that the, the drug was used with a, um, a, a group of patients that had a different pH level in the gut. And what they had to do, they found that the absorption into the body wasn't uh, um, the same in those patients. So they went right back into the model and changed the uh, like API production and crystallization process so they could um, change the sizes such that the absorption would be better in the in the vitro. So it's a good example of closing that loop as it were that I mentioned earlier for the pharmaceutical environment. Okay uh, so now I'm going to talk uh, quickly about an example in the in the process sector and I'll actually uh, hope this makes sense to you. Um, so I'm going to first start with understanding um, process digital twins. So on the axis here, we've got the model scope. Are we going to look at the particle, the units, um, the subunit, the plant, or the, um, the the supply chain? What sort of fidelity of model are we going to go for? 
Uh, and finally, where do we want to use that model? So these are the questions that we're asking ourselves more and more. Because traditionally, these models have only been used in, uh, I'm going to say, limited uh, use cases. But they don't take the model right across the entire scope where it's possible. So some of the things that we start off when we're talking to our customers is think about what are the boundaries when we're thinking about uh, the model scope. You know, how far do we want to go? Is it just a chemical synthesis, reaction, formulation, crystallize it? I don't know. Or is it, you know, the entire API? Or is it the formulation? Or is it the whole loop, as I just mentioned earlier? Right? Right. What sort of fidelity are we going to go for the model? So this is something that I find very interesting, uh, particularly as we move more and more into biologics, uh, where a lot of the, um, I say, science isn't as well understood as the classical small molecule. Um, and, and what we're doing and what we're seeing there in some of our early models is we've got a hybrid models where we'll have mechanistic models overlaid with um, or calibrated with machine learning models. And then finally, where do we want to use those? Is it concept feed design? Or are we going to take it right the way through to um, operational planning? Um, and you, you'll know what's coming next. Well, you know, we, we, we see ourselves as one of the only suppliers operating right across this space. Um, there's lots of people that can work in, uh, should we say, punch solutions, but we've tried to encompass and a lot of the R&D that we've put in place is to try and bring it all together and close that loop uh, into a, a unified uh, modeling um, platform. Okay, uh, so here's an example. So this here is, uh, is uh, I don't think I'm allowed to name the plant, it's a use case uh, where they've got multiple plants. So what you see here is uh, lots of different plants. Plants one to, uh, I think there's 11 plants on the site. Um, and what they wanted to do is because it was a continuous, I'm going to say production facility, uh, production at an enterprise level, how do they optimize it? Uh, so what we did, we went through um, what our, our tools do, and I'm sure competitors can do things like this as well. So we can actually build a model up in terms of a hierarchy um, and have those models in terms of classes. So inside here, this is inside of a plant. You can see this uh, outlet, outlet. I'm not going to go through them all here, but you'll start to see some uh, dehydrogenation here. Um, and you can see different levels there, units operations of a vessel and the likes. And we can model this, but then once you've got the classification of a model, you can then use that and if it's replicated across the systems, right across the entire enterprise. And those models can also then be characterized as a local instantiation. Um, this is just more uh, uh, model building, model and the likes. Um, and I, I guess I want to move to this situation is what this model allowed us to do moving into real-time operations. So we had the model offline, we took it to real-time, and we were able to, you know, this one had some uh, 200 operating decisions, right, uh, over 160 discrete actions, 750 uh, constraints, and we were giving updates to the model. And anyone that has worked on these models know that the real-time updates is a challenge. So we can go real-time at a plant level, but at this enterprise level, we chose to have a factor. This is a factor of 10, actually, for operations support. And that's how we're driving the productivity of this plant. So if they get an issue with a, maybe a blockage, which you all know happens, or uh, there's a problem with, I don't know, uh, coping on a particular plaza plant, you can take that into consideration and maintain production the way you uh, desire. Uh, this is a, a, another great example. Again, we've got the life cycle across the bottom. And we're working on uh, taking the process data into the flow sheeting environment, building those models, we're passing that data into uh, what we call a plant automation accelerator. I've time to de-seminize this, but just to, because to, uh, you might look at it later and uh, I'm sure other people can do this. Uh, and that actually data informs our, our DCS, our real-time control system. But what's more, we can take uh, the models that we identify for the likes of process optimization, here on the bottom, we can drive them into what we call our digital applications for things like soft sensing, real-time optimization, decision support, and the likes. And what's more, we can use that model even for more 
uh, we can then use that to simulate in an offline environment uh, for a high fidelity simulator to uh, not just for operating training, but for actually looking for process improvements for that facility. This, this is just really say taking the, the twins to the from the offline environment, desktop software. You'll know this anyway, they use GPROMs or Aspen, Aviva, you'll know this, but we take them online without the need for uh, any transitional tools straight online. And that's me. So now without that, I'll I'll hand off and we'll have um Tom, have you got some questions? Yeah, hi David. Um so first question from uh, the audience here. Um so I think this is aimed at everyone. So many organizations complain about customers not knowing when they want to order materials. If the supply chain is digitized, how will the fundamental question or piece of data of what my customers want and when be known? Um, to digitize this, one needs access to market trends, real-time customer purchasing, etc. cetera. Um, I feel we are still a long way away from a person thinking about buying something that drives the supply chain model. What are your views on that? I think Jan first. Yeah. So interestingly, one of the areas I suppose it was of my own PhD, um, but has been at the bedrock of a lot of our work that we've done over the last 20 years is this idea of understanding demand patterns. And just like the person that posed the question, we originally thought we needed to understand why, you know, what was the actual consumer behavior behind it. But interestingly, one of the things that we've done, we've understood is that actually if you start to analyze demand patterns you'll pretty much find that straight away you've probably got about 70 to 80 percent of demand that's just naturally stable that's um quite because actually as consumers um generally speaking um covid apart but even for covid for actually the majority of things if you were to think even about toilet roll or pasta the race we didn't suddenly use more toilet roll or eat more pasta because of COVID-19 we just panicked myopic loss aversion behavioral economics and thought we needed more and actually that's why the supermarkets who've got very clever algorithms kicked in to limit what we bought so that they could then better match the rate of um, supply with the rate of demand um, because they knew they had the visibility in the system to know that the stuff was there However, then if you think about something like PPE or ventilators, that was obviously a really big spike for something that was really quite unpredictable. And at that point, it's a different reaction that we needed, which was actually one to reconfigure our supply networks to actually make something at volumes that we've never had to do before. And we call that structural flexibility and the first dynamic flexibility. So what I would say is that actually most organizations, um, if they were to instigate uh, planning properly, and to be fair, a lot of um, organizations, they focus more on procurement than planning. Um, a lot of the planning systems that currently exist would go a long way to actually helping organizations to plan their supply chains more coherently. The other thing, again, and this ties into perhaps some of the responsibility angles, if you're in a business where you have you are in a you have a consumer market, particularly maybe providing into retail, don't do things that mess your supply chain up. So why run a promotion, which essentially means you're selling your product at a lower margin and increasing your supply chain costs, which lower the margin again, which gives no long-term benefit to your customer, which is why companies like Aldi and Lidl are doing extremely well by pursuing what we'd see as an everyday low price strategy, because essentially they keep demand predictable and stable and they can pass that on to their suppliers and enable them to do the same. So I think most of that is in your gift, but there are technologies there that can make it easier. Great. Does anyone add, Michael or Jeremy, do you want to add to that? I'll just uh, add this planning. It's all about planning. This was, if you take those chemists here who, who know about COSH and the need to plan your experiments before you started the uproar, how can I plan its research? And of course you can, and it turned out to be safer and you had your goods, you had everything organized and you ordered it. Um, planning what you're going to eat. Um, important to this, it's not just it'll improve your supply chain, it reduces your waste. Absolutely. And the consumers need to know about that. But there is exactly the example of why I want the information to flow around. Consumers have to know that if they do this, they themselves individually make a difference to the wastage pile. They do their bit. And we have to enable them to do their bit because the uh, Generation Z or whatever we are now are super concerned about this, but they're very. Um, sensitive to whether or not their actions will make a difference. 
and if you can assure them they will and you will use this information in the plan um then it then they will plan um so and the difference between you know I, before COVID came in my example was used to be i can come home book a ticket to australia book the opera house ticket and everything all from my room and yet in the lab i can barely order even the same the test tube that i never actually use um but some parts of the system allow me to do a lot more than we can now. So there's a lot to be done. But planning is critical, but people have to buy into the planning. And I think the, the sustainability and waste area is utterly critical as a driver to, to bring people on board for that. Um, uh, well, I think uh, a lot of industries have been doing this, particularly on the discrete side. And I look towards automotive, um, which is quite phenomenal. They, they drive a productivity uh, regime that's second to none. Um, so I used to look after some factories in the UK for for, for Siemens, and, and um, they would drive a productivity of about five percent a year. Uh, where if you look at the automotive sector, uh, they used to drive a, a, a productivity factor. Well, I'm thinking about Land Rover now. I was close to them of anything from about nine to 13 percent a year and much of that was born out of working with the supply chain in a quite a strategic way so they they had their strategic supply chain management and it wasn't about just beating the suppliers up to get them uh, the best price it was actually the supply chain had to come with innovation and help them with the production um, and I, I, you know i'll use this because it's very visual so um, a, a front headlight for a vehicle it might have had uh, 10 components and an installation of maybe 10, 10 items. They're working with the supply chain, uh, they took that down to like one component and, and the installation became five. So, so you know, they, they, so then the, the quality went up because they could manage it in a better way. They weren't doing a production line. So, so I personally think there's, there's a lot we can learn from the discrete industries which have been really forced uh, with price pressures to join that supply chain up. I just say that with the headlights, they then need to extend that onto the consumer to make that one headlight item re re reinvigorated by being able to get that bulb in there, which I can't normally do these days. Um, but that would just uh, extend well, we don't care right. too much about that. But just to also come back to a point that Jeremy made, um, I think if you look in the UK at the moment, it's something like just over 20% of batteries are recycled. Yet, if you were to look in all of our houses, you'd find big piles of batteries. And I definitely think there's something here about incentivization. We just assume that people will do the right thing, but actually we as consumers sometimes don't do the right thing because there's no um, motivation for us necessarily to do the right thing. And so actually this is where I think digitization and data can really help us to do the right thing. I was talking to a, a professor of philosophy at Warwick. I, I think he was a bit scared by my view because I wondered whether or not we need to introduce the power of shame. So imagine if you were in the supermarket and walked past the coffee aisle and you didn't buy the fair trade one. Well, at the moment you might get away with it. Imagine if it shouted out to you, you know, <laughs> she's bought the exploitative one. Then um, it may see some be change in behaviors to us choosing the one that's got the fair trade sign on it. Because at the moment we could all choose to buy fair trade coffee, but we don't necessarily, we could all choose to recycle our batteries, but we don't. So I absolutely would fully concur that when we get smart and people can see the personal benefit, and there may need to be some incentivization for doing the right thing, we'll really start to see that driving a change right away from the consumer end. Yeah, I, I mean, I noticed, Jan, you talked about carbon costs and, and, and Jeremy talked about sustainability and recycling and such. So, I mean, can, can you just explore that a bit? Because, I mean, we need to do more of it, but you're right, it's just really difficult to get people Mostly, I mean, uh, we'll give them the, the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they just are ignorant about what they can do at the moment. And to your point, that's where data comes in. But do you want to either of you develop that idea a bit? Well, I think you're right. And but people have to know. And men, some people won't buy into this at all. And some people are just in no position to do it. You know, their economic position and their time and everything. They're just no way can they do this. But others have the luxury to do it. But um, I think, for example, uh, we're in an area that is very good at, at collecting recycling, but all the recycling goes into one bin. So we are super suspicious about this. And I, either I'm suspicious or I'm very, very grateful for the poor person who has to sort all the rubbish. Um, 
Switzerland doesn't work that way. Of course, they're a bit more organized there, the people, and they've got 15 buckets to put it in. Now, that's going a bit far. But I don't know. You know, I think there are, it is this incentivization. It's the assurance that something is happening here. It's the uh, looking at the label and being able to find the information and the free trade, go back to the, what farm did it come from? It's, it, it's no. That information is no, it's just not passed on. And I, I think the consumers are often thought to be too naive. Some of them are, but they could be educated. Some of them are just too suspicious. Some of them won't believe it anyway. But lots of people will if they can look this stuff up and find it. And I think that and knowing that carbon footprint and knowing what it is. But we're looking at the sort of scenario planning. You know, is it better to buy that good? Well, it depends. If it means I have to go every day to the supermarket in a car to buy it, um, that may be not so good as buying something else that I buy once a week. I think everybody has to be able to plan their own scenario and it depends how they walk and drive and what their responsibilities are. And actually, it's really hard to make that judgment and inform it. And that's what I think exposing the data along the supply chain will do. I totally appreciate it may prevent some people from making a margin somewhere because somebody else realizes what they're up to. But the overall cost is what we're looking at here. Yeah. yeah. And I would um, concur. I think there's not a one size fits all answer um, because actually um, it's a bit like the recent diesel gate and um, that the the change in the way that we've um, then demonized diesels. Diesel cars in certain contexts are actually better for the, um, well, we're trying to balance, aren't we, CO2 versus um, emissions um, versus um, air quality. And that's quite a nuanced debate. And that's not how it's been portrayed in the press. And actually, for the sort of journeys that I do, I am better with a Euro 6 diesel engine than I would be with an electric vehicle. But if I lived in a, I live rurally, but if I lived in a city, that would be different. So it's about helping people to make the right choices and understanding those choices are different. What I would say, though, and this comes into supply chain efficiency and effectiveness, I think particularly if we look at the UK, we are seeing an increasing social divide. And I don't think we should be developing solutions that necessarily only work for one aspect of society. The reality is if we harness truly the pr principles of good supply chain management, and if you were just to think about things like food, I'll use a quite a strong term. I think we have a moral duty to make sure that all food is available to all people in the UK. Well, healthy food uh, is available to people in the UK at the lowest possible cost in a sustainable and responsible way. And actually the best way to do that is with more of an everyday low price strategy that keeps the demand stable and enables us then to plan effectively up the supply chain and minimize waste at all stages. Because actually in that way, we make all food available to all of the essential food available to all at the lowest possible price to the benefit, not just of the consumer, but to, um, there may be certain parts of the chain that um, perhaps benefit less, but it would also hopefully support farming and more responsible and sustainable farming. Too. And it's in that way that we have to join the systems together, I think, a, a little bit more. So, so Tom, do we have any more questions from, from the audience? Yeah, I've um, got a question here. Um, a uh, person asks, um, how will COVID affect reliance on global supply chains? Do you see it will have the result of deglobalizing supply and driving a more national or regional approach? Gosh, I think that goes for you first, Jan. OK, so we've actually just done a um, quite a big study. We started off with 600,000 data sources and ended up reviewing in the end, I think it was 60 um, consultancy reports and 48 academic articles to look at the future of sustainability. And we've um, got a scenario for 2035, which essentially says if we go on a more pathway to um, a utopia, what we're likely to see is a shift to more regional and local supply chains because that is what's likely to give us a better environmental footprint. I think it also is going to better support the principles of the circular economy where we might be seeing things um, since we won't necessarily own a car, we'll have solutions such as mobility as a service. Um, so it will support servitization, but it would also support um, where we choose not to own things, the, the ability for them to be repaired, reused and remanufactured. And actually some of the technologies, the likes of Siemens and others will um, develop, will be the very things that support us operating those different ecosystems. So yes, I think we'll see a shift to regional, much more regional and then local. Mike, she's fingered you effectively for following up. How do you as a global uh, organization see the future post COVID? I think I, th I think um, the U.S. elections is probably a bit more assuring at the minute because I think a bigger threat to global supply chains 
uh, was probably uh, this nationalization, the likes of popularization of politics, you know, in the US, you know, buy here, uh, repatriate goods, putting big tariffs on things. Um, we've seen over the, you know, I, I looked at this a long time. I used to look at the shipping for a while for Siemens. And I think between the year 1990 to uh, 2010, the world trade quadrupled and it was expected to carry on in the same quadruple until uh, 2030. But obviously we got all these things with, with Trump in and that, that causes a lot of problems now. That brings two things into mind because once you've got these global supply chains and this global economics, you're no longer competing with the people that you've got line of sight of in your country. You're now competing with the best in the world all the time and scale matters. Um, and these are the things that you've got when you've got a, a truly global um, uh, uh, economy and supply chain. And, and, and I don't think it's a bad thing because I think you know the consumer tends to do well out of this. But what you've also got to think about is the cost of shipping. So I looked at one particular industry and it was just a bit of study I did and it was for salmon, salmon farmers in, in uh, Scotland. And it was cheaper for them to um, have their salmon packaged, shipped to a, a container, moved to a ship, the ship moved to China, the China moved to a, a packaging bed in China, packaging that in China, and then the reverse process all the way back from what it was to do the same thing in China, in, in Scotland, sorry. So, so now what that completely misses is all the carbon miles you produce on the way. Mm. That might be cheaper for now, but how do you, how, in terms of a supply chain, I think it sounds nuts to anyone looking outside in, but someone's obviously done the economics in a minute. And that's, that's, I think we've got to get some sort of rationale between, uh, or some sort of input that we capture carbon miles in these supply chains. And that will, I think, bring things locally up for the greater good. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, that leads into your, your point about, you know, let the data set you free effectively. Well, certainly, I mean, you know, the more people who knew about that example, the more people who might figure there's an opportunity here to do something about it, as well as actually doing the calculation properly and saying, yeah, it was cheaper, but I can't stick a, a environmental friendly label on that now. And so the, the shoppers now look at that and say, that's been from Scotland to China and back again. Um, I don't, I'm going to think about that. But what the current world, I think, has shown is that we can have global collaboration without necessarily moving anything um, because we can collaborate the people. So the intellectual capital can collaborate and move around without physically moving. But I also wonder about the shift to um, end of edge manufacturing. So, you know, the, the, as the, let's dream of, yeah. you know, the sophisticated 3D printer and cutter <laughs> that sits in my house that does the final stage adaption and whatever. I don't know whether there will be, if, or you send out the, the plan for thing, but it uses the local materials. So there's, so there's a global and a local part of it. It's not one or the other. So that there are, there are uh, you know, you've probably heard of BioNTech. Um, and and, and uh, obviously we, we do a lot of, uh, um, say, automation. And, and, and before COVID, they actually produced drugs that were batch size one. That was quite a, an interest in how you work with the supply chain because you've got maybe 400 interventions to produce the, the drug, and, which will be in a vial, by the way. That's as big as it gets. And, and uh, it, was, it was difficult to try to, you know, how do you get that to affordable medicine situation and link that supply chain up? It was, it was a challenging environment, you know, and that's that where it carries on and we've made great progress there. But getting it affordable, less than 30,000, a dose for, you know, some cancer relief is uh, is the ultimate target here. Um, I mean, yeah. it, that is a major challenge because that goes with the personalised medicine, the personalised nutrition, whatever. You then need to deliver that, and if you can't at a reasonable cost, we don't meet Jan's uh, moral uh, imperative either. No, but there is they are looking. Reservation. They're almost looking at principal drugs now, scalable drugs. Uh, there's a, but it's it's kind of still in the innovation mode most of it. But um, I don't think it's just COVID. I think it, I think it's people like Trump that were my uh, my biggest alert 
Uh, COVID will probably, yeah, it has caused some restrictions, but not massive. If there are any other questions in the, the line, Tom and I will arrange for them to be uh, sent on to you and you can have a go and answer. I'd like to thank all three of you uh, for, for, for talking uh, brilliantly, as always. I've, I've, I've known uh, a couple of you for a while. and uh, So, I mean, if anybody has any questions about this, these are the contact details. Uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, Tom or I will sort it out for you. Uh, but thank you for, for, for taking part in this afternoon. And don't forget that meeting in February if you're interested in how this uh, runs out and how we can do something to make uh, the chemists be, uh, attain the moral high ground that Jan's promising us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.